Thank you for joining us on this episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel the Law Holowale. My guest today is Judge Laura, Laura Beatty Blunt. She's a judge of the 10th District Court of Appeals. She was a judge of the lower court, lower court for about eight years before she ascended to this higher court. She's someone I've known since I've been an attorney, you know, in different capacity. And she's one of those people in Franklin County and in Ohio that a lot of people look up to because she's an history making woman. Thank you for coming on the show, Judge Blunt. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, today we're going to be talking about your uh, your role on the Court of Appeals, the process of filing cases, and the process where you know you take to decide some of all those cases. Uh, but before we start, even though I've given a short introduction about you, I would like you to tell our audience about yourself. Thank you again for having me. Um, I am from here in Columbus, born and raised. Then I went to an historically black college, Spelman College in Atlanta for my undergraduate studies. And then right after that, I went to Vanderbilt University for law school in Nashville, Tennessee. And from there, my legal career was rather varied. I began my career at a very large firm in Cincinnati, Ohio, primarily doing defense work. And then from there, I decided that I wanted to come back to Columbus, where I practiced in a mid-sized firm doing more defense work. From there, I practiced with my father, Otto Beatty Jr., actually doing plaintiff's work. So I hit both sides of um, every case during my uh, span of that career. And after that, I went to the other side of the law, which is the side of making the law, where I worked with the Ohio legislature on, the, on behalf of the Ohio Secretary of State, Jennifer Bruner at that time, um, on laws particularly um, concerning voting rights and the voting process. And from there, there was an opportunity to be appointed to the Franklin County um, Court of Common Pleas General Division. And so Governor Ted Strickland appointed me after an appointment process that he had in place at the time. And I was appointed in 2009, then elected for a six-year term in 2010. Again, thankfully, in 2007. 2008, I ran for the 10th District Court of Appeals, where I currently serve. Yeah, wow, very impressive, you know, from the, from the short resume, I think the short transition office, it seems like the moment you got out of law school and you started practicing law, it's as if you've been trained to be a judge, because you've been, you've done it all. Was that intentional, or was it just something that just happened? It was actually something just that just happened, um, but it absolutely comes in handy because no matter what court you're on, when you go from being an attorney, um, you're advocating for your client. So if we can make a, any sport analogy, you are a player in the game. And then when you become the judge, you become the referee. So it absolutely um, is to your benefit to have represented people from both sides. Yeah, that's impressive because uh, being a judge, you have to be able to think from both sides of the aisle. You can, you know, even though most judges come to the bench, have an event, they will have to train or learn certain things. You have done both sides of the work before you came on the bench. So Exactly. Yes, that makes it easier for you transitioning to a judge. Then, um, you started your college career, you know, uh, majoring in psychology, and you actually graduated with honors. Why psychology? I was very interested in the topic. Go, you know, you can go to law school with absolutely any 
degree, as I'm sure you experienced. Uh, I remember I had law school classmates who were um, making a second career and had been doctors before, or people who were math majors. And so for undergrad, I just picked something that, quite honestly, I was interested in. (laughs) <laughs> because and and actually I would bet that you experienced this too Emmanuel is that you know you in law school people think that to get through law school you have to um, argue well and that is not necessarily the case to get through law school you have to be able to write well and so any um, major in college where you write is going to help you in law school. No, oh, that's awesome. From the way you answered that question, it seems that you've always planned to become an attorney. Yes, the the law was was very comfortable for me. Um, I used to joke my dad and and say that there was a a Beatty tradition of child labor, um, because my grandfather owned a restaurant and my father grew up working in that restaurant peeling potatoes or whatever needed to be done. And then when he became a lawyer, my brother and I would work summers in his law firm, um, running to the clerk's office to file things because that was before electronic filing, of course, and um, putting things in files and meeting with clients with my dad, all types of things. So you always knew you were going to become a lawyer. Did your brother also become a lawyer? He'd become a lawyer and he practiced for quite a while. He was a partner at Baker Hostetler, which, as you know, is one of the larger firms here in town and um, decided then to pursue um, his entrepreneurial dreams. And so he has not looked back in ooh, maybe 15 or 20 years. Wow. Your dad made a great impression on the children, turning both to lawyers. Wow. What an accomplishment. Yes. And you also attended a private historic black women's college, Spelman, in Atlanta. What was that experience like? Um, My Spelman experience was a fantastic one. I would encourage anyone to go there and I um, would tell them that it was some of the best four years of my life. I think the best thing about ex- my experience at Spelman was that it is not only a historically black college, but it's a historically black women's college. And so for those four years, you had gender and race stripped away. And so it really got down to the core of your being to show you what you've got. Um, and so that was very beneficial for me. Mm-hmm. And after college, you moved to Nashville, Tennessee, to attend Vanderbilt Law School. Is, was there any reason you decided to continue your education in the South rather than return to Ohio? Well, at the time, I thought I wanted to stay in the South. And um, Columbus, Ohio, when I was 21, was different than Columbus, Ohio, when I was 28. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I absolutely, I, I left Columbus and went to Atlanta, and then I, I crept my way back north until I came back to Columbus. Yeah. Did you feel like you found yourself in the South, then you came back home? I really enjoyed the South. I will be honest with you. I was choosing between Vanderbilt and Nashville and Emory that was in Atlanta, and I knew that I had too many friends and different opportunities for fun in Atlanta. So I thought that it would be the best move to go to Vanderbilt in Nashville. (laughs) You just diversified your experience. (laughs) Well, you know, self-awareness is key. (laughs) You mentioned before that you were appointed by Governor Ted Strickland uh, to become a judge of the Court of Common Pleas in 2009. Right. How was it for you when you got that news that you are going to as on the bench? Very, very exciting. Um, I will um, say, though, that I received the news 
during the workday at my my then current job. So I couldn't get too excited because, you know, I, of course I wanted to jump up and down and scream, but I had to maintain my composure. <laughs> so I think after my phone call, I waited for a bit and took a trip outside, did what I had to do. <laughs> wow. I guess from the first time you got the news, you started practicing as a judge. Oh, because, it's, it's very exciting. Because you have to keep a poker face while on the bench, too. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it was hands. very exciting, and I've continued to enjoy this job. Well, that's awesome. And at the time of the appointment, um, you were one of the youngest judges on the bench at the time. Is that at true? that time, I was. I was 34. Yes. Were you the youngest at the time? I think at the time I was the youngest. And then um, shortly after that, Michelle Early up mm -hmm. in Cleveland Municipal Court uh, won her election and she was 33 at the time. And just imagine this, this young black woman, 34 years old, just appointed to the bank as a judge. How did that make you feel knowing that you're making history? And you're also inspiring others. What oh, was that like for you? It is a it's a wonderful feeling. Sometimes you do uh, feel the weight of that responsibility, but but you understand that you have to do it. And there have been many before you who took the same responsibility for you to be where you are. So it is your duty to do the same. Hmm. Did you have any uh, kind of experience that is unique because you're, because of your race and because of your youth and because of your appointment? Well, uh, uh, because of my race and my youth, um, my appointment was controversial. And so there were those that definitely um, thought I was appointed because of my race or because of my age or because of my political affiliation or because of um, who uh, members of my family were. So you, I quickly realized that I could spend all day every day trying to convince people um, that I could do the job and remind people that I had a great academic record at the time and relevant experience. So I just put my head down and, and started to do the work and let the work speak for itself. Great. And do you did you feel vindicated when you got reelected to that same bench? when you run for that seat? Oh, absolutely. I won that election by with 68% of the vote. So it certainly was a, a wonderful feeling. And after each election, you get a map, a precinct map from the Board of Elections, and it's shaded um, by precinct. And so if I won a precinct, it was a particular shade of blue. And if my opponent won a precinct, it was a particular shade of red. And so there were a couple of tan precincts, but the map of Franklin County was pretty blue and there were several areas that were almost navy blue. So it was certainly um, a wonderful feeling and it made a lot of hard work worth it. Right, so you won by a landslide and you vindicated yourself. And then after eight years, you decided to move up the ladder and you run for a chance or a seat on this court. What inspired you to do that? Well, one thing about this court that is so different is that it fulfills intellectual curiosity in that every trial court appeals to the 10th District Court of Appeals in Franklin County. So in my job as a judge in the general division, I had jurisdiction over civil cases where the amount in dispute was over $15,000 and then felony criminal cases. And now I not only have those category of cases from like I did in my old job, but I also have domestic cases. So I have 
divorces and child custody and child support and alimony issues. I also have juvenile criminal criminal work. So it's anytime someone under 18 is accused of a, tr a crime. I also get appeals from probate courts um, as well as municipal courts. So that includes uh, crimes that are misdemeanors as well as civil crime or civil cases where the amount in dispute is under $15,000. And those cases actually um, involve a lot of environmental cases um, where a building has been declared a nuisance. A lot of cases that come out of environmental court involving dogs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And when you got on this new court, it's, you know, I believe the court does operate differently than the court where you were before, where you decide all cases by yourself with the assistance of magistrates and staff attorney. With the court you are, you are right now, you only hear appeals and you write opinion. What was that transition like for you? Having to run the day-to-day -day court where you hold court, now you have to do that with other people. It is a lot different because before I was pretty much queen of my own fiefdom. You know, I was up there and my decision was my decision. And sometimes that was scary because it was just me by myself. Um, but, you know, as far as decisions getting out or decisions actually being made, it was completely up to me. Where in the Court of Appeals in the state of Ohio, you sit in three judge panels. And so nothing gets done unless someone else agrees with you. So you have to learn to work as a team. Exactly. Collegiality um, makes a big difference in the Court of Appeals. Yeah, that must have been a huge difference for you. How were you able to transition to that? Because being the sole decider for eight years, you kind of get used to that. <laughs> Well, it was interesting because I wasn't um, on the Court of Appeals for very long before COVID hit. So everyone was home anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we were actually um, doing our oral arguments via Zoom. So, COVID so that kind of helped easier. with the transition because I was at home. Oh, great. COVID made it easier. So, and what does the 10th District Court of Appeals do? For those uh, like, I was, like I was telling you before, the, if you look at the state of Ohio and the court system in the state of Ohio as a pyramid with three different parts, the bottom part, the base part is what we generally call trial courts. So in Franklin County, that's municipal court, the Court of Common Pleas, that has different divisions, the general division, domestic relations and juvenile and the probate division. And so if you don't like what happens in any of those courts, you appeal and you have a certain amount of time to do so to the 10th District Court of Appeals where I sit. And we have to do something with your case, whether we say that the lower court, the trial court got it right whether we send it back to them and tell them they got it wrong. Um, lots of different options. Uh, we have to do something with the case. Now, when you go up to the tip top of the pyramid in our system, that's the Ohio Supreme Court. And what makes the Ohio, uh, 10th District so important is that the Ohio Supreme Court gets to choose the cases that they hear. And they only hear less than... 10%. I think several years ago, they only heard about 5% of the cases from Franklin County that they were requested to hear. And so what that means is that whatever decision was made in the 10th District Court of Appeals stands. So that means that... So we... Go ahead. Go ahead. And so that means that... Um, our court is actually a very important one, and there are three main parts of the job that each judge on the 10th District Court of Appeals does. Um, the first is preparing for oral arguments, and as you know, in oral arguments in the Court of Appeals, each side only gets 15 minutes. So we, the first part of our job is preparing for and presiding over 
oral arguments. And then the second part of it is researching and writing our own opinions that we're assigned to author. And then the third part of the job is reviewing other people's opinions to decide if we are going to join in that opinion or if we are going to disagree or dissent from the opinion. Okay. From what you've just said, it seems that you are the middle court and most of the decisions you made, 90% of them will stand without further review from the Supreme Court. Correct. That is a very powerful position to be. Yes. So how does the court decide a case? What is the process? Each judge um, has a different method of preparing for oral arguments. And even if you um, decide not to have an oral argument, your case is still going to be set for us to discuss your case at a, on a particular week. And so what happens is that we set our or we prepare for our oral arguments. We read all of the briefs filed in the cases. We do our own research. And then after that, we go to those oral arguments. And during the oral arguments, arguments, 15 minutes. Sometimes um, a lawyer gets up there and is allowed to make their case for 15 minutes. Other times, which is probably more often than not, um, your 15 minutes is filled uh, with answering questions of the judges, which is actually something that you want to do because we've read all of the briefs, we know your arguments. And so your oral argument is really your opportunity to see what's on the judge's minds and to answer any questions that maybe um, weren't addressed in your brief. So uh, oral arguments, I think, are really a good idea, even if you get up there and just say, I made my argument in my brief, um, but I'm just here to answer questions. Um, a lot of times judges really appreciate that. And so after oral arguments are conducted, we go back in a conference room and we talk about the case. Um, sometimes uh, the discussion is five minutes and sometimes the discussion is a lot longer than five minutes. Um, it just depends on the case and, and where people are, uh, whether there has to be convincing. Um, most times we leave our conferences um, with a general idea of where the panel is going to go on each case, but not every time. Sometimes we say, hey, we have to do more research and we reconference or email each other and um, come to a decision that way. How um, many judges are on the court? Eight on the 10th district. And okay. there are 12 districts and each district has a different number of judges. Okay. How many judge decide, how many judges decide a particular case? Three. Okay. How does the court decide which judges seat on any particular case? It's random. Okay. Does the clerk decide that or the judges decide that amongst themselves? I am not sure if it's the clerk's office or if it's our court administration. I know it's not the judges. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the only time that the judges become involved is uh, during uh, what we call recusal, um, where a judge for some reason uh, says that they cannot preside over a case. Uh, oftentimes it's when a judge says that they cannot be fair and impartial or when a judge has some affiliation with a particular party. So for example, if my brother was still practicing, I would recuse or get off of every case that he uh, brought to my court. Okay. But other than that, as far as um, what panels hear each case, the judges don't have anything to do with it. Okay, so lawyers can now guarantee to their clients that, oh, we're filing this appeal, we're going to draw Judge Blunt, or we're going to draw Judge Jameson, or anything like that. No, what happens is that you file your appeal and you get your oral argument date. Mm 
and then you can go on the website and see who is on the panel on that day. And when someone is unhappy with a lower court decision, what is the process of filing an appeal? Um, it is very important to file a notice of appeal as well as to file a transcript of what happened in the lower court. Um, somehow a lot of people are advised that they should file their notice of appeal, but then they forget to request a transcript from the lower court, the trial court's court reporter. And unfortunately, if there is no transcript, we can, we, there's really nothing that we can do in a lot of cases because we can't consider what happened at a hearing if we don't have the transcript. Do they have to pay for the appeal and the transcript? Yes. unless they, sorry about that. Yeah, well, first wait a minute. Let me repeat the question. Do they have to pay for the transcript? Yes, unless um, there is evidence that they are indigent, meaning that they cannot afford it. How, how will they be able to prove that they're indigent? Do, do they have to fill out a form or do they have to produce their taxes? No, they have to fill out a form um, and they have to, it's an affidavit. Uh, or you have to swear that you, the information that you are providing is correct. Um, you already answered the question why the court holds oral argument. Because some people will argue that since they've submitted a transcript, they've written a strong brief, why do they have to come before the court to argue it? Um, to answer the judge's questions. Uh, that is why it is always, well, I, I, I won't say go so far as to say always, um, but it is oftentimes a good idea. Like I said, and some people just, when it's their turn to argue, they say, I rest on my brief. I think I, you know, explained my arguments in my brief, but do you, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. And a lot of times the judges do have questions. Yeah. Have you ever had a situation where a litigant has, you know, they submitted a very strong brief, but when it was time for them to make their oral argument, maybe they're either faltering or couldn't really answer the question because of anxiety? I think sometimes that does happen, and most often um, it happens because someone is not paying attention to the question that's being asked or they are telling the judges what they want the judge to rather than answering the question. Does that, will that affect decision making? It just leaves questions un, unanswered um, that would otherwise possibly help us make a decision. And a lot of criminal defendants have complaints that once they get convicted, it is very difficult to have the Court of Appeal reverse that decision. Is there a reason why it's harder to get a reversal on the higher court? Well, here you have to consider that the Court of Appeals is really what's called a court of error. So we are looking if something went wrong in the trial court. And a lot of times we are looking at it under what's called an abuse of discretion, which means basically that the trial court really got it wrong and made an arbitrary or um, pretty bad decision. And that's a pretty high standard to meet. And so that in oftentimes also we um, we are not the fact finder, so we have to really give a lot of deference. We have to pay a lot of attention to either what the trial court judge or even what a jury decided were th was the facts in the case. Okay. And when the litigant or the person filing the appeal submits the brief to the court and requests a transcript, 
does the court review the transcript every judge on the panel? Do they have to review the transcript or do they have maybe the clerk review the transcript and point out some salient facts to the judges? It depends on the judge. Every judge does it differently um, because they use their clerks differently. But I would say, particularly when a judge is assigned to author a case, they have definitely read the transcript. But I would also say that most judges read the transcript or at least relevant parts of the transcript um, before oral argument. Because oftentimes it's a it's a part of the argument um, and particularly and, and you know this Emmanuel is personal injury cases or in criminal cases where, for example, there's an issue about like a search. Um, those are instances that co that might come down to just a very, very small fact. You know, it might come down to somebody testifying buying at a hearing they and or did they say or you know and that is when the transcript is imperative because it allows us to go back and see exactly what someone said or even exactly what question was asked of that person thank you uh litigants allowed to call new witnesses on appeal no we don't, if you did not raise it in the trial court, uh, you cannot raise it in the Court of Appeals. Are they allowed to submit new evidence? No. How long does it, does it take from filing the notice of appeal to filing the brief oral argument until a decision is made? Well, it varies um, depending on, for example, the uh, transcript and whether you want oral argument. Um, so uh, also what type of case it is, but I think, and it also depends on the judges because some judges are faster than others. Um, and some cases, you know, as you've seen, the, the issue is pretty open and shut. So that's a decision that's going to come out a lot faster, you know, than one that is nowhere near open and shut, um, where you can, you know, look at getting a decision even as long as a year. Okay. And is it, can the, let's assume that the appellant waive oral argument and the appellee, which is the person defending it, says they want oral argument, will the court still hold oral argument for one party? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then just that one party will get 15 minutes to make their argument. And after the oral argument, does the court tell them when to expect the decision or is just left open until the court decides to write its opinion? Oh, no. Oh, no, Emmanuel. We don't tie ourselves to a timeline. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we say thank you for your argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how does the panel decide who writes the majority opinion? Um, it is uh, randomly assigned. And then uh, sometimes when we go back and talk about the case, um, it uh, is apparent that the two judges who weren't assigned to write the opinion are the two that agree. And in that instance, um, the person that is the most senior of those two um, is assigned to write the opinion. Okay. And how about the dissenting opinion? Because you have a panel of three, so there can only be one dissent at a time anyway, right? Right, <laughs> right. And, and so well, what happens is that 
you know, then the person who is assigned to author the opinion does all of their writing, and then they circulate it to the other two judges um, by seniority. And so the first judge might say you know, that they agree or they disagree or ask the um, author of the opinion to make some changes, say, will you take out this language or put in some language about something else? And then um, they go back and forth on that. And depending on what happens during those discussions between the author and the first judge, um, the first judge has to decide decide whether they are going to sign off on the opinion as the author wrote it, or if they're going to write on their own. If they're going to write on their own, they might still agree, called a concurrence, um, and they're agreeing, but perhaps for different reasons. Um, or they might write a dissent where they're disagreeing, and they'll outline their reasons for that in their dissent. Thank you. And the court also has like two calendars when people are filing an appeal. They have the accelerated calendar and the regular calendar. What's the difference between the two? And that's what I was saying. Um, it, it depends on how fast you want your case to go, how long your transcript and that that's a, and a couple other factors um, go into whether uh, which calendar you request. And all of that is available on the court's website. And of course, you're welcome to come to the court and ask questions as well as call in. Okay. Let's assume that someone has a case that is very voluminous transcript, you know, three, four weeks trial, and now they want, and they want the case to be accelerated. Is the court going to push them to the regular calendar, seeing that the case is very complex? Yes, and a transcript that will be that long. And... Also, as you know, Emmanuel, particularly if that's a civil case um, that is that complex, um, there is a lot that actually goes on before the trial. Um, and so even the issue that we might be hearing uh, might be one that is about something that happens before the trial even takes place. But there could still be um, lots of depositions or, you know, interviews of witnesses that have to be reviewed. So there's no way that's getting on the accelerated calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Let me get a little uh, personal here. Uh, you recently lost your father, and your father was a giant, a, a pillar in the community. You know, he was a giant among giants. You lived a life of service and commitment to uplifting others, you know, his race and his community. He built a legacy with his name. And, you know, when I, growing up, my father used to tell me that there's no better name. No, no, there's nothing like a good name. So how are you coping losing uh, this man that left a name that is as good as that? It is, I think it's difficult for anyone to lose their father. Um, for me, it was um, unique in that it was a very, very public um, because he had impacted so many people's lives. So uh, I had to get used to that and make a couple adjustments. Um, you know, for example, uh, I know I have children and I know that people don't always uh, appreciate children's personal space. And while they might know me and feel that they know my children because they know me, I wasn't comfortable with a lot of people hugging or even, you know, trying to kiss in certain instances, my children. So, you know, we came to the funeral right before it started and we left right after it was over, uh, you know, for reasons like that. You know, I'm sure he's, he's proud of you now, you know. And, you know, again, you know, I said my condolences because uh, your father was a giant. Thank and you. And still lives on, and you are carrying the torch. Thank you. So, um, you have, you know, like you're um, talking about your father, you have such a respected name in the community, you know. You know everyone knows you, that name. Um, all across Ohio, even all across the United States. Um, how is it for you 
I mean, to live up to that name. You all, I would encourage everyone, no matter who you are, to run your own race. Be your own person. Because if you are trying to be anyone other than yourself, it's probably not going to work anyway. <laughs> um, and that is true whether you have an, an influential parent. And it's also true whether if you don't have an influential parent, um, run your own race, be yourself. Thank you. Do you sometimes feel the pressure? I feel um, expectation, but um, was, again, always encouraged to run my own race, was told that perhaps my last name could open the door, but I better be ready to stay in the room. So um, being prepared was key in many, many, many instances. And you've actually shown that you have been prepared. Yeah. And what are you, do you have any new goals for the new year or do you have any new year resolution? You know, I don't because the past year and a half, half has been so crazy. And I must confess, Emmanuel, I started 2021 with COVID. So I figure wow. 2022 can only go up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. What an eventful year you've had. You started exactly. the year with COVID. You lost your father this year, and we still have an ongoing pandemic. Thankfully, my symptoms were um, mild. And the worst part of it for me was actually sitting in a room by myself. That was rough. Wow. Wow. And it, weeks. Oh, what was that? I think the isolation period at that time was 10 days. And it just felt like the world was passing me by. Oh my God, I got to deal with that. Right. I'm I'm not a sit around type of person. So that was rough on me. <laughs> you don't get to sit around to get to be on the bench. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the only sitting you do is you wear the robe. <laughs> and the robe is off, no sitting. <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Well, I'm wishing you uh, a more uh, no healthy New Year. I hope neither one of us will catch COVID in the in the New Year, and you know because I actually had COVID too oh, in did May. You? Uh, in you know in, you know which was really which was really bad, but we're we're both we're both here. So you know, I'm wishing both of us a healthy New Year. <laughs> Peace and love for our family. Yes, I agree. Like I said, 2022 can only go up. <laughs> can only go up. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to Legal Angle. It's been wonderful talking to you, sharing your knowledge, your, your experience, and educating the community. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much, and Happy New Year. I wish you the same. And All right. my love to the family. Thank you very much. And for those of you watching us at home or listening to this on the podcast, we appreciate your time and we thank you for joining us and wishing you all a happy new year. Thank you.